evening. Leading the news this Friday, the first indictments and guilty pleas came in the Pentagon bribery case. The nation's unemployment rate fell to 5.3 percent, and Emperor Hirohito of Japan is dead. We will have the details in our news summary in a moment. Robin? After the news summary, we look at the Pentagon fraud indictments and guilty pleas in a newsmaker interview with Special Prosecutor Henry Hudson. Next, what it means that conspiracy charges against Oliver North have been withdrawn in the Iran-Contra case. Joining us are Lyle Denniston of the Baltimore Sun, former Iran-Contra counsel John Neals, and former Justice Department spokesman Patrick Corton. And finally, a look at the reign of Emperor Hirohito of Japan, who died today. Funding for the McNeil Era News Hour is provided by AT&T, combining everything people like about telephones with everything they expect from computers to make everything about information easy. AT&T. Additional funding is provided by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, a catalyst for change, and this station and other public television stations, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. The government took the first major actions today in the Pentagon bribery scandal. The targets were a Navy procurement employee, two private consultants, plus two defense contractors and their employees. They were charged in Alexandria, Virginia, with crimes ranging from bribery and theft of government property to conspiracy and racketeering. The Navy official is Stuart Berlin. The consultants are William Parkin and Fred Lackner. They allegedly work to provide inside information on Navy contracts to Teledyne Electronics and the Hazeltine Corporation. Teledyne and three of its employees were indicted today. A fourth entered a guilty plea. Hazeltine and three of its former employees also entered guilty pleas. U.S. Attorney Henry Hudson told a news conference he hoped the charges would have a chilling effect on the defense establishment. The citizens of the United States, I believe, have an absolute right to the honest services of public officials. And when individuals are receiving money for violating rules and regulations, passing confidential information, I think it strikes at the very heart of the procurement process. With the pleas of guilty today and the cases that develop in the future, I believe will have the type of deterring effect that we need to ensure and, and ensure in the future that there is integrity in the process. John Tower was listed in good condition today at a Dallas hospital. Tower, a former U.S. senator from Texas, is President-elect Bush's choice for defense secretary. The Associated Press said Tower had a cancerous polyp removed last, last, from his rectum last week. A second polyp, believed to be benign, was removed yesterday. Hospital officials said they expected a 100 percent recovery. Robin? At the United Nations, the United States strongly disputed Soviet claims that the U.S. Navy pilots had no reason to shoot down two Libyan jets earlier this week. The Soviet representative called the U.S. claim that the Navy pilots acted in self-defense completely unfounded. U.S. Ambassador Vernon Walters brought photographs which he said proved the Libyan jets were not unarmed, as Libya claimed, but were equipped with air-to-air -air missiles. Walters opened his remarks with a reference to the many nations that have criticized the U.S. during the Security Council debate on the issue. In the last two days, we have heard some intemperate statements which demand comment. The United States is not really disposed to receive lessons on terrorism from a nation like Sandinista Nicaragua, nor is it ready to be taught the norms of international behavior by nations governed by various forms of military or civilian one-party dictatorships. At the outset, it was claimed that the Libyan planes were unarmed. We have photographs that prove the planes were armed. The military, the missile pods are clearly visible on these photographs. I will pass these photographs around so everybody can see for themselves whether there were or were not missiles on these aircraft which have been claimed to be unarmed. The missile pods show quite clearly there were two different types of missiles on the aircraft hanging from the aircraft's wings and hanging from the under part of the fuselage. Libya's ambassador called the photos fakes and refused to look at them when they were handed to him. 
In Paris, Soviet Foreign Minister Edward Chevardnadze said the Libyan plane incident had poisoned the atmosphere at the international conference convening there to discuss chemical weapons. Secretary of State George Shultz discussed the issue of the Libyan, Libyan chemical plant in Paris today with French President François Mitterrand. France, Canada and Egypt all reportedly told Secretary Schultz they agreed with the U.S. that Libya had built a chemical weapons factory. Britain said the same thing earlier this week, and tomorrow Schultz meets with his West German counterpart to discuss the issue. West Germany complained today that U.S. allegations about German chemical weapons exports to Libya were groundless and had strained relations between the two countries. Chancellor Helmut Kohl's spokesman, Frederick Ost, told a news conference that the chancellor had complained to Washington. Ost said despite several requests, the U.S. had not supplied intelligence data to back up its claim that West German firms had helped Libya build a chemical weapons plant. President-elect Bush said today he supported the dismissal of two major criminal charges against former White House aide Oliver North. Independent counsel Lawrence Walsh asked for the dismissal yesterday because of the unavailability of classified documents needed for the trial. Bush told reporters Walsh did, was correct in what he did. I think it's a proper suggestion, and I think, it, uh, uh, I think he properly found that... Uh, are legitimate national security interests that must be, be protected. Well, what are you thinking about the process of the law as well, sir? I've told you my position on what I think. I think he did the right thing. In the Pan Am Flight 103 bombing, Reuters news agency reported that British investigators now believe the bomb was probably put aboard by a worker at London's Heathrow Airport. The agency quoted West German intelligence sources who said British investigators had told them they thought the explosives were placed in a passage connecting the cockpit with the luggage hold. That's our summary of the news. Now it's on to the Pentagon fraud case, dropping conspiracy charges against Oliver North, and, and a profile of Emperor Hirohito. We begin tonight with the Pentagon procurement scandal. Today, the first indictments and guilty pleas came down in a two-year investigation into allegations that defense contractors and consultants had bribed Defense Department officials for inside information about lucrative contracts. Today's indictment named two consultants, a Pentagon official bribed by them for inside information about a contract, and the corporation accused of buying the information and three of its employees. The indictment said the consultants bribed the Pentagon official $1,000 every few months for information about a Navy contract which they sold to the corporation for $160,000. Earlier in the day, the Hazeltine Corporation, a New York defense contractor, two of its employees, and a Teledyne employee pleaded guilty on related charges of fraud. Earlier this evening, I talked with the chief prosecutor in the case, U.S. Attorney Henry Hudson. Mr. Hudson, welcome. Can you... you um, can you tell us, in simple story terms, what it is you are alleging against uh, the people who were indicted today and what those who pleaded guilty have done? How did it come about and how did it happen, in your version? Okay. Well, the indictment that was returned today was a 27-count indictment that charged one corporation, a Teledyne corporation, and six individuals with a variety of criminal charges. All of them were charged with conspiracy to bribe a public official and conspiring to defraud the United States government. A number of other defendants were charged with actual bribery of public officials, engaging in a wire fraud scheme, theft or conversion of government property, and making false statements in connection with the defense procurement process. In addition, three of the defendants were charged with engaging in a pattern of racketeering activity and conspiring to violate federal racketeering laws. The indictment involves competition for a contract known as the ANAPM 424 contract. That's a, an identification friend or foe handheld uh, transponder test set. It involved a $100 million contract. The indictment extends from September of 1985 all the way to June the 14th of 1988. 
The, so the, can I just be clear? Sure, so ahead. all the charges laid today and the guilty pleas entered involve this one story of people trying to get this one contract? Is that no? The, no. The the indictment involves uh, this particular contract. Aha. Uh -huh. The guilty pleas involved the UPM uh, contract, which is uh, also a component of the friend or foe identification system, but that was a separate and distinct contract that involved uh, the Hazeltine Corporation. The common elements here were uh, several of the individuals that were indicted today, Mr. Stuart Berlin, uh, Mr. Lackner, and Mr. Parkin. Mr. Stuart Berlin is the uh, procurement official in the, uh, in the Pentagon. That is correct. Right. Uh, well, are you saying that the Teledyne and Hazeltine people work together? In this? So these were separate and distinct investigations. Uh -huh. And as I mentioned to you, the common elements were uh, Mr. Berlin, Mr. Lackner, and Mr. Parkin, who uh, worked together for each of these corporations. The Teledyne defendants were also offered a plea bargain, it's reported, but refused it. Is that correct? I'm not going to comment on any negotiations in this case. All right. The Hazeltine people who pleaded guilty today, you yourself have said, have agreed to cooperate. That's correct. That means that you are counting on them for information leading to other instances of fraud? Well, they will help us further the investigation. In addition to the Hazeltine Corporation pleading guilty today, uh, two corporate officers also uh, pleaded guilty, and they will be cooperating uh, in the ongoing investigation. Do you expect uh, this investigation to uh, result in charges or pleas by people higher up in the Pentagon than uh, is the case so far? Well, obviously that's a frequently asked question of me, but I'm not prepared at this point to comment on who may or may not be touched by this investigation. We're charging forward, and I think uh, in the months that ensue you're going to see additional action in this case. Well, let me put to you uh, something you told the Washington Post last week. Uh, it's never been my contention that the first indictment will represent the strongest or most serious case emerging from this investigation. That suggests you have stronger, more serious cases still to emerge. Is that correct? Uh, correct? Well, there are other cases we're working on. This is a continuing investigation. And as I told the Washington Post last week, the indictment you saw today was the first one we had prepared to my satisfaction. The first one I thought we were prepared to go forward on, and that's why we asked the grand jury to return this indictment. But, but not the most serious or the strongest case. I don't believe this is going to be the serious, most serious case to emerge from this investigation, no, sir. So would it be fair for uh, one to infer from that that bigger fish and more companies will be involved in, uh, in further parts of the investigation? I'm not going beyond that comment. I'm sorry. Well, let me just ask you for the record. I mean, there's been speculation that the investigation would go as high as uh, former Navy Secretary John Lehman or his... Uh, key procurement deputy Melvin Paisley. Uh, is that likely? I'm not going to comment. Again, the investigation will continue, but I'm not going to forecast at this point who may or may not be charged as a result of this investigation. It's too premature and it'd be improper for me to do that. What does it signify that, um, uh, as some people who've observed this have, have said, this was a relatively quick plea of guilty in this case. Uh, what does that signify, and would you comment on that? Well, it signifies we have a strong, well-prepared case. Mm -hmm. My prosecutors have done an excellent job of putting this case together, and I believe defense counsel recognized that. Mm -hmm. How long before the rest or, or further parts of this may unfold that we'll be seeing, as you call it, further activity? Well, I would expect that this indictment will be set for trial sometime in mid-March, and of course, at that time, you'll learn more about our evidence here. I'm not going to speculate as to when our next indictments will be returned. We have a massive amount of evidence in this case. The last time uh, I checked with the FBI evidence custodian, we had well over a million documents. We have two years of tapes. We have hundreds of people that are being interviewed. And uh, it's a long, complicated process in putting one of these cases together. Mm -hmm. If you compare the pace of this case with others, you'll find we're moving at a very good speed. When the case came to light um, last uh, summer, after an investigation that had gone on for nearly two years... Well, that's not correct. I beg your pardon. That's not entirely correct. What is correct? Okay, for two years, uh, there were a series of electronic surveillances used. During that two-year period of time, we weren't conducting any investigation. Uh -huh. We were merely listening. We did not even begin the, the, the investigative aspect of this case until June the 14th of uh, last year.
That's when we began harvesting information and putting the pieces together. Well, when that uh, part of it became public uh, last summer, you, I'm not sure whether you or some other uh, one of the prosecutors involved said this was the biggest, most massive, most widespread investigation of alleged fraud in the Pentagon um, ever in that, in that department. Since you've been pursuing your investigations over the last six months, have the ramifications gone further? Is it smaller? Is it bigger? Is it, how would you characterize what you're finding as you go uh, further into it? Well, you stated what my initial impressions were back in June, and I don't retreat from that position at all today. I see. But has it, has it got any more elaborate or any further? In other words, has it become more complicated and is it gone further than you at first thought from the evidence you had available to you when you began investigating last summer? Well, I won't comment on whether or not it has gone further than I originally forecast, but I will tell you that in many respects it is more complex than we thought it would be. These contracts are very complicated. We're dealing with... Uh, uh, a tremendous morass of documents here and for investigators and prosecutors to go through them and identify pertinent parts connect them with various transactions is a massive undertaking mm -hmm. and have it's taking a lot of time have you come to any conclusions yourself about whether such uh, fraud is endemic to the system or something in the system of procurement invites such activity well I don't believe that our investigation has developed the point where I could make those types of observations. But I will say this. This investigation focuses on a very small part of the defense procurement process. I think the majority of the men and women in the Department of Defense involved in procurement are honest, decent people. A small segment of them appear to be engaged in unlawful and corrupt practices. That's what this investigation is all about. And I hope as a result this we'll be able to cure it. Have you come to any conclusion about whether the system as it is now would be less open to fraud or less, present less of an invitation to fraud if it were organized differently, the procurement process? There is a possibility that at the conclusion of this investigation, we may have some recommendations in that area, uh, but those investigations will be conveyed to the proper authorities uh, by people at the Department of Justice. Well, Mr. Hudson, thank you very much for thank joining you. us. Still to come on the news hour tonight, dismissing charges against Oliver North, why teenagers smoke, and a look back at Japan's Emperor Hirohito. Next, the move to dismiss two important Iran-Contra charges against Oliver North. Independent prosecutor Lawrence Walsh made the move yesterday, saying problems over the use of classified documents made it impossible to proceed. Twelve other charges against the former White House aide would remain in force, with this trial still set to begin January 31st. We look at this latest development in the legal saga of Oliver North with the former chief counsel of the House Iran-Contra Committee, a former Justice Department official, and a newspaper reporter who has been covering the story. That reporter is Lyle Denniston, legal correspondent for the Baltimore Sun, and he is first. <clears throat> Lyle, take me through the decision, Walsh's decision. How did he arrive at that? Well, it probably began even before the charges were filed by the grand jury last March. It began when Judge Walsh, Mr. Walsh, uh, decided to go forward with a broad case against Oliver North. At that point, he was told, even before the grand jury issued charges by Mr. North's lawyers, that if you go for this kind of a charge, the only way that Oliver North can prove his innocence is to bring out a whole raft of secret material about what went on during that period of three years of covert operations. Now, the broad charge, you mean a conspiracy the charge? conspiracy charge and the charge that he stole government property by diverting the profits from the Iran arms sales to aid the Contra rebels in Nicaragua. At that point, Judge Walsh went forward with these broad charges. Um, and since that time, for the past nine, nine and a half months, we have been moving towards this showdown on whether or not the government's intelligence agencies would allow Mr. Walsh on his side of the case and Mr. North's lawyers on his side of the case to use what had been classified information as evidence in the trial. Mr. Walsh to use some of that data to prove his charges, Mr. North to use some of that data to prove his innocence. 
and the intelligence agencies ultimately wound up saying we can't give you uh, the permission that Judge Gazelle has said you must have in order to go forward with those charges, whereupon Mr. Walsh decided that he could not prove those charges uh, without that material and therefore asked to, to drop them. Next, what, week. what is your understanding, uh, Lyle, as to what is the nature of the classified documents that are so crucial here? Well, the ones sides? that seem to be causing the greatest difficulty are documents which I understand I identify sources and methods. That's a term of art in the intelligence community. Mm -hmm. That means how we gather secrets about other countries, how we ourselves process our own secrets. In other words, the intelligence uh, community's way of gathering its kind of sensitive, very sensitive information. Is it your impression that there are some huge secrets about the Iran-Contra affair that, that, that are in these documents that they well, don't want I've, out? Well, I've we never been know. persuaded of that, uh, Jim, but I have always wondered uh, and indeed hoped as a journalist that when this case went to trial, we would learn some more about what President Reagan did. Perhaps we might learn something more about what President-elect Bush did in those Assuming days. Assuming there was more to learn. If there was more to learn. Mm -hmm. I had thought that, that we might well learn those kind of uh, details, things that in which uh, the Iran-Contra committees uh, and the Tower Commission did not bring out in any full and final way. Right. And uh, that prospect now, I think, seems more remote with the dropping of these two charges. All right. Well, the charges that were dropped was a, were, the, were the conspiracy charge, the two broad charges. But what rem there are 12 that remain. Quickly run through those. What, what the nature of those well, are? Well, most of those, Jim, have to do with lying to Congress or lying to the presidential inquiry, which Mr. Reagan ordered in November of 1986. The Tower, Tower right. Commission. Lying either while the process was going forward between 1983 and 86, or lying to cover it up after the scandal broke in November of 1986. There also are a couple of charges suggesting that Mr. North uh, used proceeds for his own personal benefit, proceeds of the arms sales, uh, by using uh, the traveler's checks for personal purchases and getting a $13,000 security system installed to protect him and his family at home. And finally, there's a charge, and this charge, by the way, involves a suggestion that the president himself knew some of what was going on. This is the charge that Mr. Moore, North illegally arranged for tax-exempt contributions to fund some of the arming of the Contra rebels. What about the destruction of documents, of government documents? That's one of those. That's two. one of those. Uh, uh, yes, the destruction those. of documents when the scandal broke, after the scandal broke in November of 86. But from a legal standpoint, uh, at a legal standpoint that, that I can understand at least, the difference between the remaining 12 and the two that were dismissed, the, 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 have nothing, the, the remaining 12 have absolutely nothing to do with whether or not uh, money was diverted from the Iran arms sales to Nicaragua, etc. That's, I mean, that's, that, that, that's, that's out of the case now, Jim. These and have to do with very specific acts. That's right. The, right. Uh, the ones that remain. But by the way, these specific acts do involve the same kind of problems of classified documents that the two big charges also involved. For example, we, uh, we learned today in papers filed in the court that of the 300 documents that uh, Mr. North still wants to use in his defense, the vast bulk of those, all but a handful, bear upon the remaining 12 charges, not the big two. So we're, we're, we're not far wood, from finished from, uh, with this problem with classified documents. All right. Thank you, Lyle. Now, two reactions and analyses of the Walsh decision. They are those of Washington attorney John Neals, who was the chief counsel to the House Select Committee that investigated the Iran-Contra affair, and Patrick Corton, a former Justice Department spokesman under Attorney General Edwin Meese. He now works for the Heritage Foundation here in Washington. Mr. Neals, did Walsh do the right thing? Well, I don't have any way of knowing uh, whether the documents that uh, the intelligence agencies refused to declassify were properly uh, classified. Um, in my opinion, I think this may be a blessing in disguise for Walsh. Uh, the remaining charges are significant ones, and I believe more difficult for North to defend against with the conspiracy charge out of the indictment. In what way? The the conspiracy charge, I believe, would have permitted North to litigate the case on his turf. 
the conspiracy charge relates mainly to the conducting of an illegal war in Nicaragua, the supporting of the Contras during the period of the Boland Amendment. It had other aspects to it which were important, such as the diversion of funds uh, and the concealment of what was going on from Congress. But it would have centered around the war in Nicaragua, the support of the Contras. That would have permitted North uh, to put forward his strongest and most emotionally appealing defense, that he was uh, saving lives, that he was uh, defending uh, uh, democracy from communism, and he would have permitted him to wave the flag and argue that heroism and perhaps some bending of the rules was appropriate under the circumstances. The other charges don't lend themselves to that type of a defense, uh, at least not anywhere near as easily. Uh, they involve lying to Congress, lying to the Attorney General, shredding documents, uh, altering official documents, uh, uh, falsifying chronologies. Uh. But couldn't, couldn't a defense also be made, he lied to Congress in the interest of national defense, he shredded the documents in the interest of national defense? It can be, but I think it is much more difficult. Uh, those charges are uh, fairly specific. They are the type of charges that are frequently brought in criminal cases against uh, other people in, in, in this country. Uh, uh, most people who lie to federal agencies or, or obstruct justice or congressional investigations, if they get caught, they get indicted for it. I don't know of anyone who's been indicted for conducting an illegal war or even for moving uh, money from one governmental purpose to another without a, an official appropriation. And, uh, so Walsh is better off, in your opinion? In my opinion, tactically, this case is stronger for Walsh without the conspiracy count in the indictment. Mr. Corden, what's your reading of that? Well, first of all, I think that uh, Mr. Walsh is left in an awkward position, having dropped the two major counts, because he is now left with having spent $12 million of the taxpayer's money in order to prosecute Ali North for having allowed a security system to be put in around his house to protect him and his family from Abu Nidal or from buying a couple of snow tires uh, using traveler's checks which he later paid back. Twelve million dollars for that? That's an awfully difficult thing for someone to go back to the, the public and answer for. So you do not agree with Mr. Niels that uh, he, he, he is left with a stronger case, tactically at least? Well, from a legal standpoint, it may uh, simplify the task of prosecution. But on the other hand, uh, on some of these counts, I would not care to be the prosecutor uh, in trying to persuade a jury that Ollie North ought to be sent to jail for allowing that security system to be put in. Uh, Brendan Sullivan is going to play that jury like a, like a Stradivarius. There's not a jury in America, I think, that you can find that could convict him on something like that. Is, your, is it your view that the thing ought to be dropped now? I think absolutely it ought to be dropped. There is nothing here left that is worth prosecuting, nothing here that would have been taken all the way to indictment by uh, the average prosecutor working for the Department of Justice. Matter of fact, there's, if I may sure. insert one other thing, there's, there's one significant point here that uh, I don't think is fully appreciated, and that is that the conspiracy charge uh, and the other charges that depended upon the use of classified material would never have been brought in the first place. There would not have been an indictment had Mr. Walsh been a prosecutor working for the Department of Justice. Because within the department, before you can proceed to indictment in a case like that, you are required to get all of the clearances from the intelligence community first before you put somebody like Ollie North so, through the, the ringer of, of indicting him and trying to bring him to trial. So when Lyle said that uh, three years, not three years ago, but whenever, when was it, Lyle, that it uh, um, uh, doesn't matter when it was, but when the whole, even before he went before a grand jury, he knew he was going to have problems. You're of saying course he did. a year ago. Sure. A year ago. A year mm -hmm. ago. That the if this had been a Justice Department case, it would never would have gone to yeah. indictment in the first place. You would have found out before that point that you'd had classified material you had to rely on, but could not use. Would not have been a charge brought in the first place. Mr. Niels, what do you think of Mr. Corton's point that uh, for stop it right now? What's the point going on? Well, first of all, I guess as, as you can tell from what I've already said, I think yeah. the, the other charges were the more properly brought. Um, I had questions from the beginning about the conspiracy count and the diversion count. I think the others are proper criminal charges, um, and I believe it is important that they go to trial. I don't know how they're going to come out, but I think it's important. Why is it important that they go to trial? Because uh, I believe the most important issue arising out of the Iran-Contra affair is whether the rule of law will apply to activities conducted by our government in secret, and I underscore in secret. It is very difficult to bring the rule of law to bear on intelligence activities, secret activities, because they're secret. 
And if, when we find out that secret activities have been conducted in a criminal way and, and charges are brought, and it then turns out that we can't bring those charges to trial because they were done in the intelligence world and therefore there are classified secrets which will prevent the trial, we, we have really told the entire intelligence community that they're immune from the law. And I think that's a, that would be a very serious and unfortunate thing. Mr. Corden? Well, I don't want to say that's silly, but I think it's disingenuous because the charges that are being brought here are not, as, as John himself noted a minute ago, charging Ollie North with having illegally diverted funds or having done something in that realm that was wrong. They're all things that revolve around <clears throat> whether or not he gave Congress information that it was asking for. Was Congress asking for that information properly? Uh, were they exceeding their bounds? What you get right down to after you analyze most of these counts is a policy dispute between the legislature and the executive. The Congress wanted a lot of information from the executive, not all of which it was entitled to, perhaps very little of which it was entitled to. They wanted to try to influence executive branch foreign policy decision making in a way that the Congress is not entitled to do. They're trying to expand their power in the realm of foreign policy and they're trying to criminalize the dispute with the White House. That's what these counts are all about. They're not about Ali North. They're about a policy dispute between the Congress and the executive. They're not about what Mr. Niels just said they were about? Not the, in the larger the, sphere. The, uh, not in the larger sphere. Criminal acts operate, uh, done under secrecy, uh, well, in secrecy because just, of their intelligence? Take a few of these. Uh, for example, one of the charges, or perhaps several of the charges, I guess, involve whether or not he misled or lied to Ed Meese during that weekend before all of this was announced in the White House News Conference. Um, did he make false statements within the meaning of uh, uh, the uh, Title V of the U.S. Code? The fact of the matter is that that was an informal inquiry. The president asked Ed Meese to ask some questions, try to get to the bottom of it, but it was not an official criminal investigation. To charge someone with criminal violations for which one could suffer jail and heavy fines when in fact all you were talking about here was an informal inquiry seems to me to be bizarre. Most of the rest of the counts don't make an awful lot more sense to me. Mr. Niels? Well, I guess as I've already said uh, several times, uh, it is not unusual for the Department of Justice to bring criminal charges against people who obstruct official proceedings, uh, shred documents, uh, falsify records, uh, lie to Congress, lie to the Justice Department, and I wish... Even I the Attorney General, you mean? Yeah. A lot of the Attorney General, um, and I wish that I could be guaranteed that when I have a client who is under investigation for similar things, that I could go to the Justice Department and say, well, all they did was lie to uh, you or somebody else, and consequently they shouldn't be indicted. We're not going to resolve that one, but let's, let's take up the point that Lyle made, and it's been made by others, that as a result of the decision, and assuming the judge, is there any question, by the way, that the judge will, will go along with Walsh on this? I don't think there's any question about it. He has a hearing on Monday at mm -hmm. which he's going to examine the question, but uh, and, and under the federal rules, he must agree to do it before the, the matter is dropped. But the judge himself has said over and over again, for the last nine, nine and a half months, that he had serious problems with going ahead with these counts anyway, even before Wallace before. made the point. Okay, so let's assume that he does. Do, do you believe, Mr. Niels, that, or do you agree with Lyle that as a result of this, the full story of Iran-Contra will now not be told? Uh, no, I think it was, uh, first of all, I guess I should say, and I've got a little bit of a bias here since sure. I was involved with the congressional <laughs> investigation, but. But I should say that we saw all of the documents uh, in their unclassified form, and there were none that were, had any bearing at all on the president's responsibility for the diversion or, frankly, for any of the other uh, episodes in the Iran-Contra affair, which were concealed by reason of their being classified. Uh, and and uh, the second thing I guess I would say is I think it would have been very unlikely that either North or the president, Reagan, should he have testified, would have said anything different about the president's conduct than North said to the Congress and the, or that Reagan had said uh, to the public. So while I can't absolutely rule out that some additional piece of information would have come out or will come out in the context of the criminal case, I believe it was very unlikely and I doubt we lost anything in that regard. 
Do you agree with that, Mr. Corey? Oh, sure. After the, the eight or nine months that the Congress spent holding countless hours of hearings and producing thousands of patients as transcripts and many, many more interviews that were conducted in private with people who had never testified, they have a very full, complete account uh, insofar as it can well, be known as to what happened. There's one dimension into which the congressional effort and the Tower Commission effort did not go, and that's the role of George Bush. George Bush has never been subjected to a rigorous accounting of what role, if any, he had in that. Now, I'm not suggesting that I know he had one, uh, but he certainly was not asked to answer in the same way that President Reagan was asked to answer. Uh, and that is something that might well have come out at the trial, or at least there was a prospect that that might have come out at the trial, but it, and that prospect is now gone. But it did not come out in the congressional uh, hearings at all. Is, that, uh, is there some explanation for that? Well, the, the only thing that I would say is it is true that uh, although we, we all got, both through the press and through the Tower uh, report, some idea of what President Reagan had to say about his own knowledge and involvement, uh, we didn't learn that much from George Bush. Uh, but in terms of, of evidence from other sources about uh, future President Bush's involvement, we explored those thoroughly. There wasn't very much on it, frankly. And, uh, and we concealed nothing that, that we learned. Mr. Gordon, anything to add to that? Well, <laughs> I, I have great affection for Lyle. We've known each other for years and dealt with each other at the department. But I'm always amused by the journalist's propensity to squeeze the last ounce of blood that can be had out of a story. I don't think anything involving George Bush would, would add anything significant to this story. Based on what I know of conversations that Ed Meese had with uh, George Bush at the time, as well as all of the others. I don't, I don't think there was any significant role on his part. Jim, I think there's another point here that, is, that, that bears repeating. I think it comes a little bit off of what Pat was saying earlier. These are difficult issues to try to raise and resolve in the context of a criminal case. This is a case that is regulated by the Constitution itself, and it's regulated by this bizarre 1980 law, the Classified Information Procedures Act, and to try to put on this trial and this criminal process the burden of political revelation is asking it to carry a lot more baggage than it can. But, but it's all we've got left now. There are not going to be any other inquiries. Clumsy and, and inartful as this process might have been, it, it was worth trying, I think, from at least from a news perspective, mm. whether or not from a governmental perspective, uh, that's arguable, I suppose. You're be, you've been close to the uh, procedures up till now. What is your feel? Do you think that uh, the, the trial of Oliver North will, in fact, proceed on these final 12 counts? My present inclination is to think that it will not, because I think that the classified documents issue is going to continue to plague this proceeding throughout. Uh, and I think at some point, my own conjecture, purely off the wall, is that Lawrence Walsh is going to decide that he can't go forward with anything of real consequence in this case, and the case, I think, ultimately will be aborted. But we'll know that in uh, late soon. January or maybe yeah. in February. Yeah. The sad thing is what all of this says about the independent counsel law. What it says is that after two years and $12 million, by the way, you know what the average U.S. Attorney's Office spends? In a year, five million. And they bring hundreds and thousands of cases. He spent $12 million, and he's come up with almost nothing. Yeah. Uh, well. That's another whole. State that's another whole thing, and we'll. I'm sure we will have you and others back to talk about it, depending on what the results are. Gentlemen, thank you all three for being here.